If you're running our service business and you think you're gonna compete on price and that's your strategy to be the cheapest, that's the quickest way to go out of business. Financial discipline and commitment to the business, focus on the operational basics, that those playbooks that already exist in our space today, get your hands on one of them and just start executing. Standardization, simplicity, those are guiding principles that every leader needs to be driving towards. For going on two years, I've partnered with service scalers to do our Google Ads, PPC, and SEO. And the results have been huge. It's been really exciting to watch as our website consistently jumps up rank as we're using more technology and we're moving faster than our peers who are all using legacy home service marketing companies. We use service scalers for PPC, our local SEO, our on-page website SEO, and our LSA. So give them a call if you're looking for leads. Welcome back to Owned and Operated. Uh, today on the show, we have Chris Hoffman from Hoffman Brothers. Welcome, Chris. Hey, great to be here, guys. Yeah, this is, uh, is going to be good. I'm excited to have you on. Um, and we're going to be continuing on with our Legends series with Chris today, which is basically the big boys of the industry. Uh, so yep, wow, really I just excited. lost my train. Well, I'll, I'll pick up really excited to have <laughs> you here, Chris. Yeah. We're, we're, we're interviewing some of the biggest players in the industry and mm -hmm. obviously you being out of uh, St. Louis and, and doing an amazing job there and then moving over into Nashville. We'd really love to touch base on that and how I see your red stickers everywhere I go. It hurts a little bit, but at the same time, you know, all the ships, Jack, in the, you just need to ocean. sell, just sell to Chris. I know. Um, but but yeah. honestly, we we really respect the, the business and what we hear from Hoffman in the area. It's very, very difficult to steal Hoffman customers. So, Jack, the beauty of our space is uh, in a market like Nashville, you can have three or four hundred million plus pound gorillas. So uh, plenty of room for everybody to win. See, everyone <laughs> says that, but it's much easier to say that when you are the hundred pound gorilla telling that to the, <laughs> to the little squirrel running by, like trying to grab some banana crumbs. But uh, no, I, I do agree, and, and uh, we we appreciate it. But between Nashville and your home location, which is more competitive? Man, I'll tell you, this is an interesting question because we we actually share price books. The pricing strategy largely mirrors one another between okay. St. Louis and Nashville location. But in Nashville, I'll tell you what, you see a lot of price dropping in these shoulder seasons. Oh, like yeah. it seems like there's yeah. not like a, a there's not pricing integrity is very fickle in Nashville, where somebody who's selling. Yeah. The system for fourteen thousand during peak season will sell it for like six uh, during the That's shoulder Cleveland season. We're, yeah, we're trying to wrap our head around that yeah. because we, as an organization, philosophically, we just think it undermines our our pricing, the integrity of our pricing, if we're that quick to discount shoulder season or otherwise. So we we have um, some limits to discounting to make sure that we don't come across as a little little bit silly how how deeply we'll discount. We're going to dive into the history of Hoffman, but the what has been in. So Cleveland is like a non-owned market. So there's no like market winner yet, which is kind of interesting. Uh, we're unique for a MSAR size. And we're starting to get interesting competitors. So like Aaron Gaynor from Eco, they're going to be sliding up to Cleveland at some point in the next year or two. Uh, Chad is in Columbus. I'm sure Cleveland is on the radar at some point. And I'm honestly kind of like looking forward to it in like a weird, almost sadistic way, because I think you want to, I think you want to know how you stand up to some of the best operators in the space, like steel, sharp and steel. And like, I want to know, like, I want to know if I'm, you know, good enough to meaningfully compete. I will also say this, that the competitors that I like competitors like Eco, if they came into St. Yeah. Louis, uh, the competitors I don't like are the Chuck and the trucks yeah who might yeah. look like they're selling yeah. the same equipment as you because it's the same model and serial number, but just their quality of work is so much lower. Yeah. They don't pull permits. Yeah. They do, they cut corners. Uh, those are the competitors I hate competing against who just uh, will try and win on price and customers can't discern that their quality is garbage. Yeah. Yeah. I was yeah. going to mention that when you, when you mentioned the price dropping is we, we have a, a um, issue, especially in HVAC in Tennessee, where there's kind of a loophole in um, licensure and so there's a lot of people operating with either very minimal licensing or no licensing at all and getting really? away with it, absolutely decimating um, the price point in those off seasons, especially. But yeah, I mean, wild. we see a lot less of it now that we're getting bigger because it generally the people who are calling the bigger companies are calling the bigger companies and the ones who are looking for the deals are finding the smaller 
smaller companies. We, you know, Jack, and we can, we can, I don't want to derail us too much. We can jump into history uh, and whatnot, but <laughs> yeah, just on the course. licensing thing, one thing we now have the privilege of seeing uh, Nashville and St. Louis are on two polar opposite ends of the licensing complexity spectrum. Oh, sure. Uh, Nashville, as you just indicated, Jack, is a contractor license statewide. We could hire 10,000 people tomorrow to operate under our license throughout the state. Uh, St. Louis is one-to-one -one individual licensing, 10,000 hour apprenticeships uh, that must be tested and individually licensed for every single field pro showing up to every single house. So uh, literally polar opposite extremes, but the St. Louis model is as frustrating as it can be at times. It certainly has an impact on uh, it's a moat. Uh, quality in the market, training. It keeps, mm -hmm. it, keeps uh, it makes it a lot harder to greenfield than a market like St. Louis. Uh, than, than in a market like Nashville. Well, we jumped right in. I'd love to take it back a step or two <laughs> and dive into the last decade, really, of your career uh, running Hoffman Brothers. Yeah, that sounds great. And I'll, I'll, I'll try and keep it too brief, uh, keep it somewhat brief, but I uh, joined this industry, well, like a lot of folks, probably like you, John, grew up around this industry, right? Mm -hmm. I worked in it countless summers. Uh, my dad used to joke, he'd call us cheap, me, uh, me and my brother, chief scrappers, uh, i.e. we yeah. separate the different types of copper. Yep. And when we were, we were using a sawzall to cut apart air conditioners. Uh, so been around the business and have worn a lot of hats from call center, you know, from high school through college, summer jobs, you know, from call center to out in the field, setting condensers, hooking up disconnects, line sets. Uh, but it wasn't really until post-college. I, I joined the Marine Corps, uh, left the Marine Corps 2014 as a captain. And then I uh, uh, was talking to my dad about coming back into the business. And, you know, one thing that my brother and I feel super blessed and fortunate about is our dad is not the kind of uh, patriarch who wants to maintain control and take mm -hmm. the keys to the business with him to the grave. Uh, he was very quick to trust and empower my brother and I, and he really wanted our business uh, to remain a, a family business for, for the foreseeable future. Uh, and so the three of us put our heads together. There was a lot of alignment around our vision, around what we could accomplish. And to my dad's credit, he was very quick uh, to not only transition leadership, but, but give Joe and I a pathway to quickly transition ownership. Uh, and he uh, he's still involved in the business today. He wears a project manager hat. He's on our sales team, helps with complex projects, commercial projects. He's an engineer by background, pretty uncommon mm -hmm. uh, from, a, a you know, in the 1980s, he, he went to trade school after he was already a mechanical engineer with a professional engineer's license and then jumped in a service van during the day. People in the 80s, I think, thought he was nuts. Uh, but he would say, <laughs> you know, that that background together with trade school laid a really solid foundation for him and for our business when it came to quality standards. Uh, so 2014, we we uh, uh, I left the Marine Corps. 2016 is when I finished uh, an MBA program, and that's when my brother and I put our head together with our dad. And it was 2016 that we uh, uh, bought the business from our dad and, and jumped right in head first. Uh, I would say one of the key sort of inflection points early in that journey is we decided. Actually, I remember being on a call with at the time it was a business coach named John Conway. Uh, from oh yeah, Network. John's a good now guy. Works for one of yeah. yeah, now works with guy. Redwood Services, Redwood, one of the big yeah. roll-up groups. But John was on the on this call and he was telling us how, how great Nextstar was and how mm -hmm. it would transform our business. And and I remember being a little skeptical. And at the time, I thought I was pretty – I thought I knew my stuff. I was like, shit, I just left the Marine Corps. I got this MBA. I think I can figure this out on my own. And uh, I almost almost made a terrible decision, which would have been to say, you know, no thanks, Nextstar. Get out of here. Uh, but thankfully, uh, uh, humility and the desire to learn won the day. And, uh, and we joined Nextstar in 2016. And I credit a lot of our, our growth um, over the, the years that followed to Nexar Network. And at the end of the day, businesses like ours, they're not, uh, there's no magic bullet. There's no magic, magic thing you can do to just make this thing grow. It's about doing the basics really well. And Nexar has a, a process playbook, an operational playbook that outlines what those basics are. From what you do in a customer's home, uh, to how you assign priority levels to calls, to, to how your dispatch team should manage the 500 calls that are on the board in a day, pricing tools, you name it. Uh, so we just got that playbook and we started executing with rigor and and that set off uh, a, a really uh, awesome growth trajectory. It went from nine and a half, uh, 13 and a half to 18 to 23 to 30 to 40 to 56 to 80. Where did we end? Last year, we were 110. This year, we're short of budget. We're going to be 130 or so uh, in there this year. But uh, uh, largely organic growth with the exception of the roofing acquisition. Yeah. Uh, and, and what we did was just focus on the basics and just really leaned in heavily to that that uh, that playbook Nextstar gave us. And I would say we also coupled together, we were trying to be really intentional around how purpose and values and a lot of those soft things show up in a business like ours. Because candidly, I think 
uh, having that that compelling purpose values. I think those are the things that prevent culture, quality, and reputation from becoming casualties on the side of the road as you chase mm-hmm. this ambitious 30 plus percent growth each year. 30 plus percent growth is a lot. And so we've been 30 plus percent growth for a long time now, but it's different when you're doing 30 plus 30% from like, you know, three to 10. And even now we're in the mid twenties and we're at, we're at like, we'll probably end the year mid forties and it is a lot to manage. And, uh, and I think about you often because I'm sitting here like I next year, like I want to slow down, but it's almost like, how do you slow down? Like, because I think momentum just keeps going. Like how I'm sure there's a lot to it. But how did you think about managing that? Yeah, we used to joke all the time. A couple things. One, growth is actually really expensive. And to, to do it in a That's healthy way- That's my first thought. Yeah. Is like, it's like, that consumes cash. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think at our peak in a single year, we bought $6 million of trucks, right? After you yeah. outfitted them, shelving, lettering. And like, it's eating your cash. And uh, uh, so not only is it expensive in terms of the, the capital outlays you have to put in place, but the other way that it's expensive, if you're going to do it the right way and in a healthy and sustainable way- is you really have to lean into what I'll call some some of your your SGNA body, your overhead infrastructure, your people yeah. infrastructure, leadership infrastructure, whether that's purchasing and customer experience and digital mm-hmm. strategy and marketing and all these all these purchasing supply chain, uh, all these other different functions that if you don't really make some people investments in those areas, uh, they're going to become pain points in the very near future. Uh, and so as a result, if you're keeping the toggle at this thirty plus percent growth rate. Uh, you can see some margin compression happen from that because you're intentionally uh, yeah. continuing to build uh, the overhead body that your business needs next yeah. year and the following year. And you're building it a little bit earlier just to make that journey a little bit smoother, a little bit less turbulent, yeah. uh, a little bit more certain. Um, and so that we, we always joke that, well, maybe th- this would be the year that we should just slow down <laughs> and we could we could have 22% EBITDA margins and yeah. just pump the brakes and pause at 130. Uh, but I'll say this, culturally, uh, growth and change and challenge uh, and the opportunity that comes from it for promotions and yeah. advancement and new roles, uh, that's become part of our culture. And at this point, I don't think it, it would be really hard to slow this thing down and, and to culturally say, you know what, we decided yeah. not to grow this year. I think everyone would look at me like I've got uh, you know three heads. Well, I don't even uh, think so you I, can. I, I think it'd be the same thing internally for us. Like, I think it becomes the culture. Like everyone's always looking for the next thing. And it's yeah. not just you driving. You have a hundred for us, a hundred whatever. You have four hundred whatever driving. Yeah, it, it's. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Like, what was the biggest growth year percentage? I don't know. I'd have to do some math on those. I would say not. I would say we were remarkably in twenty twenty three and twenty twenty four. We were below thirty percent. They they were tougher years. They are tougher years. Uh, and there's even a disparity within our our business this year around like St. Louis is a large, stable, hundred million dollar plus operation. Uh, is growing at nine percent this year, right? Yeah. But we're, the reason we're we're growing at a a, a consolidated just under twenty nineteen percent is because of the Nashville market. We're we're growing at fifty six uh, percent, and because of our roofing acquisition is also experiencing really high organic growth. Uh, but I so it, I would say it, it, at any point it was really stayed between like thirty and forty percent, and then twenty twenty three and twenty twenty four have just been. Uh, more challenging environments, uh, no doubt about it. And we budgeted yeah. this year; our budget was like thirty-four percent organic growth across, consolidated across all yeah. all three entities, and um, uh, and we're off. We're at nineteen. It's been a tougher year. Yeah, that's a it's a lot of growth. Uh, I know the challenges that I'm sure you've dealt with, but that we're feeling. Leadership's been a huge one. Cash, I mean, that's a huge one. You know, it just consumes cash growing, and sort of the how do you create a good process? How do you create something that works when you feel like you're flying so that it doesn't break again? So it's sort of like taking the time you need while you also don't have time. Uh, Yeah. Leadership. I mean, that's been a challenge, a persistent challenge every year. And I would say it's only been exacerbated recently because uh, as you, you know, Nashville was our second market. Then we had this roofing acquisition. Uh, We've got another opportunity that we're looking to close on here in four weeks or so. Uh, big business, big opportunity, big operation, and uh, and the constraint continues to be within all of our locations and across the, the different businesses. Is we need folks who understand our, our process playbook, who can execute it, and ultimately who can take ownership of everything within their span of care without having to reach up the chain to ask for help all the time. Right? 
and just that those caliber of leaders that can that can do that and exercise sound judgment and make good decisions for the business for the team uh, that is hard to find and yeah. it, and it continues to be a real challenge we're trying to solve it a number of ways of course we want to recruit externally when, when that yeah. makes sense uh, but we're also looking internally and saying who are our really high potential rock stars i mean one of the uh, the gentleman who launched nashville um and who's been instrumental in our, our transformation of our roofing business uh, he started with us and our plumbing underground team as a laborer busting up concrete right in, in basements. And mm. and now we, we found him. He was a, a really talented uh, individual that was working at the front line in our business. And we were able to develop and pull him up through our organization. And I'm sitting here today saying, I have no doubt there's four more of them inside of our business. How do I find them? And how do I start pouring into them today? Uh, and so we're trying to be really thoughtful around how we're building that talent internally. When you think about, uh, you know, as a part of this series, what we've been trying to unpack He's like, hey, that's a that's a hell of a journey, right? A hundred and mm-hmm. ten to, or a hundred and thirty from from ten. That's that's wild. Uh, when you think about some of the pivotal decisions through any point, but I would say especially those early next hour obviously would be one of the one of the big ones. Um, how, what do you think those were? Sort of that twenty mark, the thirty, the forty. I'll make a few comments on that score. Where I see a lot of operators, a lot of business owners go off the rails is as soon as they reach what I'll call like a, a moderate level of success, you, know, you get to $10 million and you made a million dollars in a year yeah. or a million and a half or whatever you end up making. And then you get comfortable and then you you make substantial shifts in your lifestyle spend and all suddenly uh, you're sucking cash out of the business that it needs to continue to, to march down that that high growth path that you had originally thought you wanted to go down. And I can say for the first four years in the business, I don't think I changed my salary. I was at like eighty five or ninety thousand dollars a year. That's all I paid myself, right? Even as we passed like thirty million dollars, mm-hmm. uh, paid myself that same salary, and that was at that was in there. I had a truck from the business, but but it was financial discipline and commitment to reinvesting in the organization and putting your money where your mouth is uh, and going all in. Because to scale quickly, it, it does suck up capital, particularly in those early years. Uh, and in those early years are also when banks would be hesitant to lend to you anyways. If banks get a little skittish around a $5 million HVAC business or even a $10 million HVAC business. Uh, and so it can be hard to access uh, bank uh, financing to support your growth. So you really need to make sure that you've got a commitment to reinvesting in growth. Uh, the other thing I would say is is don't think you have to reinvent the wheel and don't think you're smarter than the thousands of peers who've gone before you. Uh, I, I preach a lot about Nexstar and say how great it is. Uh, there, there's a lot of other organizations like Nexstar, but the point is uh, go learn from those who have gone before you and don't think that you're going to go figure it out on your own and you're somehow going to do better than the collective wisdom of these thousands of contractors who've contributed mm-hmm. their knowledge to these playbooks that exist out there. So uh, financial discipline and commitment to the business and focus on the operational basics that those, those playbooks that already exist in our space today, get your hands on one of them and just start executing. That's great. Yeah, advice. The, I think John, actually, we, we have an episode on that specifically on reinvesting in your business. And you said something incredibly similar to what Chris is saying right now. It's, it's wild from a third party to actually hear both of you uh, fairly successful in the, the space. The cash has to go from the somewhere. exact same Yeah. Thing. I mean, I, I, my yeah. salary was a little bit more modest, but I, I think we start we were a little bit smaller when, when I started. But I paid myself $65,000 until we crossed $15 million. <laughs> uh, And then I upped it slightly. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's a yeah, modest house. Don't have a lake house. Because I think uh, the thing that mattered, like – what I, what I joke when I tell my wife is like, I'm a, I'm a simple man. I don't need a boat. I don't need a Lamborghini. I need to build a hundred million dollar business. And that is literally simple. it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a simple guy. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I think I, I agree. I mean, we, I usually see it like earlier on, not even mm-hmm. that like million of cash flow to the owner. I feel like I see it a lot at the three to five, like they make their first 200 grand and they were a technician in a truck once. And now they've got a boat and a lake house and a $90,000 pickup. And they're like, I'm good. I'm good now. Yeah, not to mention uh, the time you're spending on that boat and at the lake house. Uh, that's I can tell you in those first four years in particular. Thankfully, I didn't have kids at the time too, but there wasn't a lot of time for for other hobbies, right? If you're if you're really leaning in to, to executing on that high growth plan. What's your time look like now? Like, what do you, what does, what does your day to day? You know, it's, it shifted in February when uh, a gentleman, Matt Wyatt, came off of our board. He'd been on our board for two years, uh, a phenomenal leader. He spent 20 years in the Air Force uh, before retiring as a colonel. And he led the first Department of Defense TEDx speaking series when it was at Scott okay. Air Force Base. 
and a local CEO happened to be there who at the time was running a $700 million manufacturing technology business. And he recruited Matt, this was in 2014, uh, 2013, to join uh, his company here in town called Barry Waymuller. Uh, Matt joined in a, a, a role that wasn't quite defined, but uh, uh, this leader, Bob Chapman, knew that he needed somebody to really help him lean into this leadership development piece mm-hmm. to make sure they could they could scale their organization in a healthy way. And uh, so Matt spent 10 years there, really, as they went from $700 million to $3.5 billion and acquired another 150 companies over that period of time. And Matt was at the tip of the spear with respect to how they were leaning into their people strategy, leadership development, integration work. Um, so I asked him to join our board as we were entering this next stage of growth, and he's been just a really impactful contributor. And when I thought in two thousand or in February twenty twenty four this year, I was saying, "Man, I need." I, I, I think I, one of the things I take pride in is is I want to be able to recognize when I'm no longer when I become the constraint. When I think there's someone that could do my job better than me, I want to get out of the way. Right? Mm-hmm. I, I joke about firing myself seven times over the last eight years. Uh, because I'm firing people who are going to do a far better job and have a, a far greater business impact on the span of care that I give them, that I take from me and give to them. Uh, and this was an example where I thought uh, Matt's experience, what he's bringing to the table, uh, uh, is going to allow him to to propel our business forward as we think about this next stage of growth, uh, which will include uh, a much more uh, acquisitive growth and, mm-hmm. and really excited at, at some of the things that we're working on there. Uh, and hopefully we'll be able to announce soon. But uh, uh, it's been been a ton of fun. So my, my day looks a little different. I've been been spending a lot of time helping with our pipeline building efforts uh, in there. Uh, re, we're resetting our board now to bring in some different perspectives based on what what we think uh, the voices we think we need to help us execute on this next next four or five years. Uh, but uh, I now have two folks in my span of care where I used to have seven or eight. Uh, so Matt and our CFO are, are the two folks in my span of care, and I, I try and. Uh, work through them and it allows me to focus externally on how we're uh, we're guiding our organizations how we're allocating capital across our uh, our sort of global balance sheet and business and uh, be a little bit more strategic and a little less tactical in my approach but i will say and then i'll shut up is whether you're in my seat or matt's seat or any one of our leaders like we have this mantra around having a frontline mm-hmm. obsession in our business and uh, that shows up. That means that that I'm spending time doing ride-alongs, uh, staying connected to what the people are doing, what our people are doing who are serving our customers. We're right there where mm-hmm. the rubber meets the road. Uh, and so I think no matter how how sort of deep our, our structure gets and how many layers there are to it, I hope to always remain uh, really really focused on on what's happening at the front line and making sure that I'm spending time there uh, to see it with my own eyes. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, do you mind speaking on? how you came about. So I think in industry, anyone who knows Hoffman Brothers and knows you uh, knows the focus that you guys put on culture, right? You guys don't do weekends. You have amazing benefits that are extremely hard to compete with. Um, just across the board, the focus on your internal customers, what I call it, the, your, your, your employees, the front line, where and how was that decision made to have that intent and that focus? Where did that come from? I think it starts with my dad. I mean, my dad was, if, if Joe and I, my brother and I hadn't come into the business, it was my dad's intent to, to candidly just give his $10 million business to his, you know, four or five senior leaders who'd been, been, been with him for a long time. Um, and he was always just very generous. Uh, and he wanted, I mean, he, I think he derived the greatest satisfaction, not out of uh, what he could consume himself, but but uh, out of what he could do to, to impact others' quality of life. And uh and so we, when we started on this path, like it, it, at the beginning of the next start journey, there was what, what we've done a good job of, of trying to do as a business is uh, connect the dots between our company's ability to win and how that you know, the financial results that we achieve and how that impacts our ability to provide great outcomes for our team members who in turn need to deliver great outcomes for our customers. It's, it's that circle, right? This is nothing new. And so we were very intentional, particularly uh, when we were rolling out the next star playbook to say, hey, if you can buy into this, I know this is a lot of change. It's harder. It's more difficult. We're asking you to learn something new. Uh, but if you can do this and execute it at the level we're asking you to, uh, that's going to allow us to do things like provide free health insurance for you and your family, uh, right? Which is almost now with our, our renewal is just 11, was it 11.9%, right? I, we're now paying close to $20,000 per person for family coverage. Uh, we pay 100% of the premiums, but we're able to do that. We're able to have the 8% 401 cash, uh, 401 match. Uh, the nine paid holidays, the up to 20 paid days off, so 29 paid days off a year for a lot of our team members, uh, big investments in tools, training, mm-hmm. Hoffman Brothers University. I mean, all those things 
right? It's only because we're creating great results as a business, right? That we can pay for those things. And that relies on our team uh, buying into the processes that we're delivering. And of course, they're trusting that we're going to take really good care of them uh, when they execute on those things. So, and at the end of the day, the last thing I'll say on this is it is a losing battle. If, if you're running our service business and you think you're going to compete on price and that's your strategy to be the cheapest, like that's the quickest way to go out of business. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just a, a race to the bottom. That's a brutal journey. Like we don't want to be the cheapest. As a matter of fact, when people call us, the last thing I want them to think is call Hoffman Brothers. They're the cheapest. I want them to think, call Hoffman Brothers. They're the best. Their integrity is beyond reproach. Their quality of work is amazing. Their professionalism is awesome. The way they communicate with me is unlike any other service provider. And if we do all those things really well, people happily pay a premium for that kind of experience. And that's where we try and play. Uh, and to play at that level, we need to have premium talent, right? And then our, our strategy around compensation and benefits needs to align with our desire to have premium talent. Uh, and so that's that's kind of the, the how we think about it and how we try and position our business uh, and how that informs our, our approach to people. I don't know that I want to say opposite approach, but it's close. Two of the other legend uh, guests that we just had on, uh, Tommy Mello and Chad Peterman, where they they went multi location pretty early, and they did you know they, I think both of them around ten to fifteen million. I know, I know Chad was fifteen. I don't remember exactly Tommy's, but whereas you stuck in your principal market for a lot longer than that, seventy eighty million dollars, and then you went and greenfielded, and now you're going to acquisitions. So I'd like to unpack each of those because that's three like very different things uh, that we've talked about with anybody so far. So yeah. in the first one, I mean, walk us through it. That's different. Yeah. Yeah. John, so if you pull up your service Titan and you look at your heat map on, you know, where your, your revenue generation by zip mm -hmm. code, if I do that in St. Louis, I see that the bulk of our hundred plus million dollars comes from like the same freaking zip codes and the same parts of St. Louis. Yeah. So what's, what's easier? me to go pick up and buy a new building, find a new leader, uh, start building a, a brand in a market where our brand doesn't exist, or to say, you know what, see these zip codes over here where there's 200,000 people and we're, we're not doing, we're doing a million dollars of revenue, let's go penetrate there. And so uh, my thought is like, I personally think it, everybody has different strategies, but I think for some people, and I'm not saying this is Tommy or, or Chad, uh, some folks, I think ego leads them to say, well, I need a second location. I need to be multi-location. I wanna be in five states. And it's like, look in your, draw a 40 mile radius around your office and where are you not penetrating within your existing service area? And guess what? It is a lot easier to go penetrate in those areas than it is to say, we're going to go launch new yeah. uh, three or four or five or six hours away. Uh, so that was, that was our approach. That's why we didn't open a new market until we were, whatever it was, 60, $80 million. I forget yeah. what the number was, uh, but we had a lot of room in those, those core markets. Yeah. We feel like we've been challenged on this recently because you know we're in Cleveland so Cleveland big market and a very like geographically spread market so you know the top to bottom is 90 minutes and we're roughly in the middle it's kind of an interesting problem because as we think about we have exactly what you just said so 45 minutes away 50 minutes away there's there's zip codes that have exactly what we're looking for in a customer base good population good uh Good income, good, really, you know, everything that we would want, but it's 50 to 60 minutes away. And if we were to follow the model that the last uh, two legend guests have sort of talked through, then it would be popping up a location because it's an hour away. We would place it there. We would run. And uh, we ran multi-location for years. So we have a really healthy respect for just how difficult it is. Even if you're just an hour away, it is difficult. So we're, we're doing our best to figure out how we can run 40 to 60 minutes away or even 70, 80 out of one location and just dispatch better or use tools better or somehow, uh, you know, how, how do we fulfill an hour away and how do we build a membership base there? Is that a challenge that sort of resonates with what you guys had to go through. If you need help with your overseas hiring, let me tell you about my friends at Sagan. For years, we have been hiring overseas team members in our call center, accounting, and marketing. We've typically run this discipline ourselves, but the more we hire, the more complicated it's gotten. As we started to add deeper expertise hires, like hires in accounting, in AP and AR. So we called up my friends at Sagan and we said, hey, here's what we're looking for. How do you guys think you can help us? And they were awesome. The thing that I like 
like about their model is it is a monthly retainer instead of this giant 30 to 50% of the first year salary of whoever that person is that they hire. So it's this monthly charge. They hire X amount of candidates a year and it's been really good. We just hired our first two a couple weeks ago and they've already been awesome. They're jumped into the accounting department. Check out Sagan Go, which is S-A-G-A-N Go.com for more information. Yeah. Let me ask you this. So if you had if you had a $200 million business today, would you rather have 10 $20 million locations or $200 million? Oh, I would rather have two. Like, I would rather have two. Yeah, yeah for and, sure. And that's a choice. And that's yeah. a choice. Uh, and you can choose that because it's expensive to Greenfield. I, I, I think we, we spent uh, three and a half million dollars cash out, excluding the real estate purchase. Uh, before we started returning cash to the mothership from a, uh, our, our launch in Nashville. Yeah. And like uh, three, that's really expensive. Like imagine the market penetration I could get inside of St. Louis had I said, I'm going to throw three and a half million dollars at a customer acquisition strategy mm -hmm. uh, in there. So, I mean, not that you shouldn't Greenfield in our case, like I think we're going to reach a saturation point in a market like St. Louis. I, I think we could get to 150 or 200 million there. Uh, but I, I think we're going to see the growth rate slow. So we need to get our a foothold in these new high potential, high growth markets so that we can sustain that 30 plus percent uh, consolidated growth rate. Uh, but it's expensive. And, and I think uh, I think oftentimes folks should should really take a hard look in their own backyard before they they say, I'm going to go take this plunge a couple yeah. hours away. Well, also, you did where, a really good you job did... with the Greenfield, too. There's other people who Greenfield into Nashville that had yeah. to sink significantly more money and and. Um, for less results, as, less results. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. I think that's something that's obviously overlooked as well is, is that 3 million for the listeners was a very good job. Yeah. Yeah. In terms of the return. So, of the I return. mean, to build on that point, Jack, like, but it's a different game. So if I'm private equity, uh, uh, and I, I won't name names, but uh, <laughs> one gentleman told me that he'll spend uh CEO of one of the big platforms for me, he'll spend $20 million uh, cash out to build a $25 million brand in 36 months. And that math works for him because that $25 million brand, if it's doing 15% EBITDA margins at you know 3.75 million of EBITDA, that's going to trade at 15 times under his mothership brand, whatever that, mm -hmm. whatever that comes out to, 50, 55 million. He did, if he spent 20 to get there, he just created $25 million of enterprise value, even though it was like a super inefficient use of cash, uh, that math pencils for him. Uh, but for me, as someone who's committed to private ownership for the next few decades, uh, that doesn't pencil for me, right? I, I don't have $20 million burning a hole in my pocket to go build a $25 million business. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we spent three and a half to build a $15 million business. So if you look at sort of the the efficiency of our cash outlay compared to theirs, uh, I think we're, we're, we're being better stewards of our finite resources. Definitely. Yeah. We, were you dispatching in, in my scenario of an hour away? Is that how you were handling it or is St. Louis not that wide? Like, how do you geographically spread without the pop-up locations? When I say geographically spread, St. Louis, we, we serve end-to-end -end of our service area. It might be 90 minutes that we'll drive. Uh, I mean, it's roughly a take our office, which is in the heart of the county, and and maybe draw like a 40-mile radius yeah. you know, around it is, is roughly, uh, roughly where we serve. And in there, St. Louis is a big, sprawling metropolitan area, 3 million people, 625,000 households in the MSA. Uh, but it's really spread out, and there's just a lot of room to penetrate in that. That's almost that sounds zero. almost exactly like Cleveland. Like, yeah. It, yeah, it's just a wildly large area, four million people. But there's like so in St. Louis, like there's I would say just like uh, like Murfreesboro is to Nashville, like Edwardsville is to St. Louis, or Wentzville is to St. Louis, and there's all these like vibrant communities that are at the edge of St. Louis, right? That might yeah. be thirty or forty five minutes away that we don't have a lot of great penetration in. But I don't need to build a new warehouse and a whole new infrastructure leadership team to serve them. And I, I just think that's the easy place to lean in for a lot of businesses uh, before jumping elsewhere. And just drive useful, further. Like, <laughs> drive a little further. And if you get enough people and a big enough team, I've seen some folks operate in like zones, especially if you're in, in an MSA. Well, that, that's what we're preparing to do is we, we're going to be right. zone dispatching for profits because it's, we have people that live in those areas exactly. and they drive an hour to work. But it's, it's like far from the warehouse, but we think the way that we sell and fulfill should be able to do it. Uh, but conventional wisdom would be do a location, but I really don't want to do another location. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. The thing with zones that I would wrestle with, and I'd be interested in how you solve it, 
is um, what you want to make sure is in every zone, you have every kind of technician, every kind of field pro. Yeah. You're, you're going to have yeah. your selling techs. Yeah. You're going to need to make sure you have all the, the repair techs. You have the right skills for all those different things. You're going to need maintenance techs. So if you don't have a deep enough bench mm -hmm. to make sure that every zone has the right mix of talent uh, serving it, then you could find yourself in a situation where, oh, shoot, in zone C, I don't have a single selling tech and I'm getting a lot of 10 plus year old breakdowns, but I'm sending folks who flip 4% of 10 plus year old breakdowns. What am I doing? I'm shooting myself in the foot. Yeah, I think the way, so the way we work is almost everyone's selling tech. So our plumbers, they'll, I actually think it works really well for this type of thing. So they're going to drive around in a pickup and they'll have minimal parts to do small repairs. And if it's above a, depends on the trade, but it's either 500 or a thousand dollars, then they send an installer to follow them and complete the work. In some ways, it's less efficient if it's a small job because it's two visits to do a thousand dollar invoice. But in we found that it's a lot less reschedules for the customer. We're on time more, um, and then technicians that are really good at talking to customers and presenting options are often not the technician that's really good at having no callbacks. So we divided that pretty early on. So when we think about you know, new market, even if I did put a pop-up location an hour away, the way we were going to put that is all I need is three techs. And then we would run fulfillment installation out of our home branch because I can send a pickup anywhere. So it's Ford Rangers and Tacomas. Yeah, that's an interesting model. I hadn't contemplated our, our service pros, like they'll, they'll self-perform any of the work they sell. Yeah. They won't sell new equipment, but to your point, I could have one of my best uh, selling techs who the customer chooses option B and all suddenly they're replacing a compressor and yeah. they're there all day versus right. going to the next call. Uh, it, it, that's an interesting model. We haven't really uh, messed around with building sort of like the, the techs that can help execute the work versus those that are better building options. Um, and yeah, that's interesting. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah, we did it in 2018. And I think it solves this where we can basically deploy these, you know, pickup truck technicians that can solve small stuff. They have pack outs for truck stock. So we don't really have to deal with that very much. And then if it's big, then they just ship it off and install does it same day, next day. Yeah, yeah. that's great. So hopefully that works. Now we don't do it that way for HVAC, but we do it for that way for the other trades. So when you were going from, well, one, I mean, 80 in one market or, or 100 in one market is obviously like very large. You know, we've talked to, uh, yeah, Mike Barnett. Mike Barnett. Barnhart, yeah. Barnhart, yeah. Well, fortunately, I'm going to edit that part out. But uh, <laughs> he's a good guy. I was talking with Mike, and um, and they were sort of describing how they felt like uh, so their plumbing is only growing three percent year over year. So it's it's slowed down a lot. But their Columbus is still growing in general a lot because they've added HVAC. So that's been the that's been sort of the catalyst. So maybe they'll get up to a hundred. How and you seem to think. I mean, you said 150 to 200 million in in one market. That's a lot. You know, when I think about that, I can think of two operators that run 200 plus million in one market, uh, four Ooh. seasons. And yeah. who's the guy in Phoenix? Parker and Sons. Parker. Yeah. I can only think of two that run 200. Is Those there, the is there a third one? For me too. Okay. I don't know. I'm I'm like, you were going to teach me one. <laughs> no, man. No. I'm like, I mean, because I think ABC is 80 or Gettle's biggest is 80 or 90 in Vegas, cool right? In Atlanta. How big is Cool Ray in Atlanta? That's a big brand. I don't know what they are. I don't know. I actually thought they, were, like I thought they a, were 70 there's, there's quite ish. There's a few that are like 100 to 150, but the 200 yeah. plus. 200 is a lot. lot. Yeah. yeah. And, and the yeah. markets that have 200 are twice the size of St. Louis. So I'm not, I'm not really like, hey, you can't do it. I'm just like, walk me through it. Uh, we've done, I, I don't have it in front of me and it's been probably 18 months, but you can do yeah. some work around like, uh, what is, what's our, what's our market share here in St. Louis. And the last time we did it, we pegged ourselves at like seven or 8% in HVAC. It varies by trade, yeah. but you can make some assumptions around number of households, yeah. how frequently they replace their yeah. HVAC systems at what average ticket. And you can like roughly size the HVAC replacement market, uh, in, in our world and like we're single digits. Still, so I think you can do it. It's just a matter of like, how deep can you penetrate? Because if, yeah. if the total market's a, a billion dollars a year in St. Louis, can one company get get 20% of that? Maybe. It's freaking hard. It's a hyper-fragmented space. Yeah. But maybe. Yeah, I remember, uh, I don't think it's Len the Plumber, 
But there's some company in the Northeast that like one in three houses has their membership program. Mm -hmm. Do you do you know? Do you remember their name? Horizon, maybe. Would it be Horizon? It might be. But it it was like because that's probably the most extreme example of the share that one company can take. So okay, so you greenfielded into Nashville. Why didn't you just keep greenfielding? Why did you buy the roofing company? Mm -hmm. Uh, great question. A couple of thoughts on the Greenfield. One, that takes a unique uh, local leader to go from zero to 15 million in 36 months like that. And, and I don't have unlimited numbers of those leaders sitting on the bench. Uh, two is it's a slower path to growth. I, I always like the idea of burning a Greenfield, having, the, having that running. Uh, it's a cash out endeavor, right? Every time you launch one, it's starting a three to four year cash out endeavor before it starts returning cash. Uh, so there, there's that to contend with. I wouldn't want to have like three going at once just because it's that's just a big cash burner uh, in there. But I, I would also say we're, we're getting to the point where where as we as we generate cash, we need to find more good homes to deploy it uh, in support of our growth. And and if we're only going to burn one green field at a time, right? Have one of those going at a time. Uh, then we've got to find opportunities uh, to, to deploy it elsewhere in our business. And I don't want to just like pour it into organic growth, like marketing spend in St. Louis, uh, because I think there's diminishing returns on on that if you start to just keep pouring it in and trying to buy market share that way. Uh, and candidly, I'm starting to see a lot of folks, I've been shocked at the amount of inbound we've had from folks, particularly founders who have held on this long and haven't sold because mm. they don't want to sell the private equity. They don't like what it stands for. They've heard horror stories about uh, what happens when that goes wrong. Uh, and there, there, there's folks now that now that we're kind of putting up the flag saying, hey, we're interested in being being a potential acquirer of choice for a lot of these folks. We're getting a lot of, uh, a lot of outreach. And so we've been able to be really selective around who we're engaging with and how we're thinking about partnerships. But that's that's open the door. So roofing, we think that's just a really exciting space. A lot of similar industry dynamics. Yeah. Uh, a lot of industry tailwinds. I, I think the the model is not that dissimilar. Uh, some things are much easier, and I think there's a lower level of sophistication throughout the roofing space today that allows some early entrants uh, to experience a lot of growth. Um, uh, we won't. I, I said we would double our our roofing business in the first twelve months that we owned it, but we're going to be a little short of doubling. We're going to be we're going to be close uh, yeah. in there, and it just I think it shows the opportunity that's in front of you in that that space. Now, I, I like to acquire in the the HVAC plumbing electrical arena, and we've just been selective on those opportunities. We have one that that hope, hopefully we'll be able to share here soon, but really exciting, good opportunity, good business, uh, and if we do this the right way, I just think I mean. Some of these partners we look at, they're, they're great, sizable businesses. Uh, the one we're looking at uh, here shortly, uh, hopefully be able to announce, is, is close to $30 million or so. And there's just yeah. so much opportunity, synergies and otherwise, yeah. uh, by integrating these businesses. And there's so much cultural alignment. They're positioned the same way we are as just a, mm -hmm. a high-quality, high-touch provider, uh, long-standing business in the market. They care a ton about their people. And it's just a partnership designed to win for everybody. Mm -hmm. And I think we kind of bring a unique flavor to our partnership structures and not to go too deep on this, but I think we get really creative and cool in our, how, our, how we structure our operating agreements. So we bring these partners on and say, you know, we're going to buy 75% of your business. You're going to keep 25%. Uh, we're going to give you this formulaic redemption approach to redemption on how you can, how you can exercise a, a liquidity option on your remaining interest. And it basically says in the operating agreement, we define at what multiple we're going to uh, allow them to sell the remaining interest. And then we fund within 90 days uh, after they uh, after they give us notice after a three-year lockout period. Uh, and they have the, the ability to say, you know what, I want to hang on for the next 20 years with you and be a partner with you. Or they have the option to say, you know what, after five, I'm ready for that second check because we've grown mm -hmm. like crazy. Uh, and if you look at that roofing brand, like what a cool story. I mean, that, that business is going to two X and EBITDA right. on year one. And that, the owner there, I'm sure is excited to be along for the ride. And like, man, look what's look, look, what the potential is. I want to do this for at least another five uh, and see what happens. And same thing with this, uh, this next opportunity we're looking at. I mean, that's going to be a huge opportunity. We're, we're, uh, I would love it if we could take them from, from three of EBITDA to six in 12 months. But I, I think those things are, are very real possibilities uh, when we're looking at the skills we can bring and how those line up to the the opportunities that exist in these these potential partner businesses, the other last thing I'll say is like I just want to be very thoughtful about how we do it. 
because uh, some of these consolidators, I won't name names, have bought, I think at a high, one bought 40 brands in a single year, four zero. Like you tell I me think, how I you think can I think Apex integrate. did 50. I thought they did a hundred. At one point they were doing, dude, they were doing two a week. I I met with, um, I met with him. Yeah. What what was that guy's name? It's a different CEO now, but I met with the then CEO. We were at some event together. Yeah. 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 And it was like, he's like, we're going to do, we've been doing two a week. And I'm like, that is insane. That is insane. I go back to like our approach when we're buying businesses is we're not just buying them and setting them on a shelf and saying, do the same thing you've always done. I want to be able to thoughtfully integrate, add value, create mm-hmm. synergies. Like I'm truly creating an integrated platform. And, and right now I only have the bandwidth. I, I can't buy two $30 million businesses at once. I, I wouldn't because I don't think it'd be fair to the partners that I'm partnering with and what I'm saying I can do to add value to them. Yeah. I, if I bought two, I, I would not deliver on that commitment. I would be short selling each of them. So we're going to be very thoughtful in our approach. And we're just going to make sure that every partnership that we do is a freaking grand slam. Uh, and we're gonna. Yeah. If that means we only do one a year, fine. If it means we can do two, great. Uh, and I think that'll change over time as we build more uh, sort of integration team infrastructure to support that effort. And are you are you looking at additional verticals, or is, or are you sticking with kind of as roofing, HVAC, plumbing? That's it. Uh, we're staying in that box for now. That's not to say I wouldn't be interested in some homes parallel sort of home service tracks. I, I like pest control. Uh, foundation repair is interesting. We're doing some stuff in pool service just uh, as a uh, minority partner. Um, so I, I like a lot of these other spaces, but I also don't want to cha- you know, get the shiny object syndrome. I, I want to master. I want to stay in our lane and there's a lot of opportunity in HVAC, plumbing, electrical and roofing. Uh, tons of opportunity there. I'm, I'm going to sort of repeat this back. I, th- I think I got it. But it's the, took the big location, pretty big, green fielded started acquiring you're seeing acquiring you're going to continue to greenfield but like you'd be due for your next one here shortly then because nashville was a few years ago um my constraint is people on that so like i sure if i if i had the right person i'd do it tomorrow yeah i just don't have the right person to do it no it's challenging i was talking to um and i think i quoted you honestly i don't remember who it was but i'm pretty sure it was you that tweeted this and it was it, it it's not complicated to find like a air quotes gm uh, more like ops manager for a $5 million brand, but finding one for a $20 million brand is much more complicated. Like there's a ton of them that could successfully run a five, but like, there's just not that many that can run a high growth 20. Totally. So yeah, I get the problem. It's a huge issue. And if you're like Jack in your case, right? If say you want to hire a GM, it's like, you don't want to hire the guy that can just run your business at its current size and complexity. Yeah. You would want to hire the guy that can run it at the size and complexity that you aspire yeah. to be, right? At that next stage. Yeah. Uh, but then that becomes hyper expensive. The talent becomes hyper expensive. And that's been a huge issue here recently, just with the introduction of private equity into the space. Mm-hmm. Those that GM level talent has become very for particularly for very good operators of large, like single look at 50 plus million dollar locations. Uh, the compensation levels are very high. And there's a lot of uh, uh, management incentive equity being thrown at these folks, which which is kind of like a coin toss. It could be worth nothing or it could be worth a million bucks or it could be worth yeah. a couple million bucks. Uh, but I think that that's got a lot of talent locked up and a lot of talent, uh, uh, particularly the really good talent is very expensive. The market for GMs in the HVAC plumbing electrical world uh, at, at 50 million plus, that's a great place to be if you're you're trained mm-hmm. to be in that role because you can you can make a ton of money. Well, there's also just not that many. Like we, we just went through this. Um, With the sales guy. Yeah, we just went through and we hired a director of sales recently. And like the person that we were looking for, there's maybe 20, like there's maybe 20, uh, like in industry that already knew the sort of solutions for the problems that we had. So it it was, um, yeah, it's a complicated problem. Yeah, yeah, it totally is. How do you, how are you thinking about the next green field? Obviously, lo- obviously talent, that's a big issue. Do you feel like you've selected the target or are you debating between a couple markets or how, how does that look? We know which one we would do next. Um, I don't know that I'll throw it out here. I'll keep, we, we've got a great, nice. we've got a great methodology that uh, there's nine factors that we plug into this model. We use a lot of, a lot of publicly available MSA data around yeah. some things that you mentioned, home ownership rates, median household incomes. There's some binary variables around licensing, a uh, number of different factors we plug in there. And then, uh, uh, and then we punch in, MSA. We're trying to stay in the Midwest, South. Uh, we, I don't want. I'm not. I'm not going to go to the coasts or go too far mm-hmm. away. Uh, but we, we we punched some locations in there, and uh, uh, it spit out where we think we ought to go. I will say what what I do think is interesting. We've 
we're looking at some things in central Missouri, central Illinois. That like I acquisitions? Call like, uh, yes, or a possible greenfield. And I yeah. kind of like, we've been ideating around this hub and spoke model idea where if St. Louis is a big hub and there's a lot of infrastructure there, both in terms of people and talent, uh, but also warehousing, supply chain, purchasing, replenishment, a lot of the things that a location needs. Uh, if we open a location that's 90 minutes away, do we need a warehouse there or can we do same I mean, day Chad's theory from the hub? Right? Yeah. 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 It yeah. makes, it makes greenfielding from $3 million to 400, you know, and then and there's probably some brand awareness too. Cause if you're yeah. in Springfield, Missouri or Columbia, yeah. Missouri, and you watch baseball in St. Louis and we're all yeah. over baseball in St. Louis, there's probably also some like marketing yeah. fringe benefit that exists in these peripheral markets. I think the maybe unspoken benefit it is if you if you launch in these sort of tertiary or tier three or whatever you want to call them markets, like we just said, it's easier to find a, a GM or ops manager from five to twenty. Like so, you, there's talent available for smaller branches that just isn't available for larger. So you yeah, could get a branch right. to ten million dollars, and you would finding talent wouldn't be as complicated. As Nashville. I think that's right. And I would operationally, if we did that, like this spoke model, I would have the spokes likely report up under the span of care of the GM of the hub. Uh, yeah. So just in terms of like organizationally, that's cleaner than having, you know, 15 GMs of which 10 of them are leading like $6 million operations. So in the next, the new stage of growth for Hoffman, as you see it, is to continue driving a greenfield at a time and really doubling or tripling down on acquisitions, which this is a new discipline for you guys. Newer yes, in the I'm last year or two. Yeah. And sustain really high organic growth uh, as yeah. high as we can. I don't, I don't want to be, I mean, I think a really good indicator of like an organization's health so often you hear when folks talk about their growth rates, particularly PE or, or folks that are actively acquiring, yeah. they say we grew, we grew 30% this year, but if you net out in organic growth, growth from acquisitions and you look at organic growth at the unit level, at the brand level, uh, some of the stories being told are pretty abysmal. It's like, oh shit, actually your organic growth rate across all your existing brands, if you exclude acquired EBITDA, uh, you shrunk in 2024. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but those are the stories people won't tell. And I want to make sure that we're continuing to fire on all cylinders with the, at the organic growth level, at the brand level. Uh, and then any acquisitions we're doing, they need to be super accretive and we need to have the ability to, to, to meaningfully drive value creation inside of those businesses. Uh, and then I think the other greenfield play outside of HVAC plumbing and electrical is uh, roofing. Now that we've built the roofing playbook and mm -hmm. we're in the process of getting that uh, uh, dialed in, like I think it will be very easy to greenfield in the roofing space because if I go to a Nashville to greenfield the roofing brand, uh, we're really good at top of funnel activities with marketing, CX, call center. We've got all that, that infrastructure in place and that's easy. Then we just need to curate a network, a really high quality network of independent contractors and subs and then some... Uh, sales folks, boots on the ground. The other thing you can do from a sales pers perspective, if you have a roofing brand and an HVAC brand in the same market, the seasonality with uh, HVAC and the seasonality with roofing, they don't peak at the same time. Uh, so we could cross train salespeople uh, to run both roofing bids and HVAC hmm. bids. And it uh, uh, it increases sort of the, the sales team's utilization rate. Uh, and you don't have to actually add net FTEs, net headcount to accommodate that. And they could make a lot more money and uh, you could share in some of that savings by not needing additional FTEs. Um, so so again, the, the green field of roofing in Nashville, I already have the salespeople, I already have the call center, uh, have an internal marketing agency ready to go and fire it up. I just need to recruit a network of independent contractors some crews and some production coordinators on the ground uh, and we could be off to the races. So I actually think green fielding on the roofing side is is something that's in our in our deck here uh, that we're thinking thinking pretty pretty hard about. But our, our ambition, you know, we say by December 31st, 2028, we want to be $400 million top line organization with 1,500 team members uh, uh, on the bus. And and I think that's something we could potentially outkick that uh, depending on some of these. It seems like you're, things. I mean, in total, aren't you, it was 150 with roofing or 160 with roofing? No, no, we're under, but we, we're targeting 140 this year and we're going to end up being 130. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Okay. Yeah, we would, with I thought roofing was not a part of that description earlier. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, it is. Uh, so with with this acquisition that's that's coming up, that would put us right at 160 or so this year. Yeah. This year, I mean, obviously there's some obvious challenges. Has there been anything aside from the obvious, like 
consumer financing or leads? No, I, I mean, I, no, I don't think. I mean, it's I, I, no different than what I think everyone else is is facing. Uh, I also I get really hesitant, like talking to teams about this because yeah. it's a very uh, it's very like defeating and it, it absolves you of responsibility when we when we give ourselves all these yeah. these excuses why external factors are causing us not to hit our goals. Yeah. And, uh, you know, just uh, as a leader and, and as leaders in our organization, I really ask people to focus on only those variables that we can influence or can control. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, yes, I know there's noise out there. Yes, I know interest rates are up and I know consumer spending's down and I know household debt is up and all well, there's an election. I got it, but we can't control that. We can just control what we're doing today to impact the outcome tomorrow, today. Uh, and so I like to to keep the focus there. So. Uh, those things exist, but mm-hmm. but uh, and I don't want to ignore them, but I also don't want to allow them to become excuses. Um, yeah. uh, one one CEO I appreciated his comment. He said he said we don't participate. We choose not to participate in recessions. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I just kind of mm-hmm. like that mindset of like yeah, you know, participation in a recession and down economy is a choice. Like and we're going to make sure we run our business where we can we can overcome uh, even a tough market. Well, you've taken the business from uh, ten to uh, one hundred and thirty. If you had a passing message to two extremely handsome young entrepreneurs in the space, one bald, one not bald, on this Zoom screen with you, <laughs> what what would that look like? <laughs> Thanks, John. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you, you guys are doing it, and, and I think just like be patient. I think in our world, right when you when you tune into these podcasts or you look at social media, yeah. it's uh, oftentimes it feels like people around you are doing it overnight, uh, and it's not freaking easy, right? I mean, Jack, you're, you're building a business. I, I never navigated the stage of growth that you're navigating, and it's probably harder than the, some of the stages of growth that that I'm navigating. Those, those early pre ten million dollar range, like that's freaking tough. But uh, stay the course and be patient, right? Uh, something great things aren't built overnight. They're not built in a year or two years or three years. Uh, and I'd say just stay the course, stay disciplined, stay focused, stay focused on the basics. Uh, and, and I think the great things will that'll be the outcome, no doubt. My, my last question, and we'll tie this out, you've continued to say focus on the basics, which I like a lot, and something that you've done what seems like is from the outside looking in a better job than what we've done is the ability to keep things simple, whereas I, we have a tendency to overcomplicate as an organization, which continually slows us down as we continue to try to make it simpler and simpler and simpler. Is there a a tool or something that you can give us to walk away with on that? No, I think it's a mindset. And I think leaders have to be aligned around this. Like we, we have a saying, we say simple is scalable, right? Mm. And it's like complexity is not scalable. Uh, and so when you're designing comp plans, even if you think you have the best comp plan in the world, if it's super yeah. complex, that's not it, right? Mm-hmm. And, and not only simple is scalable, but I would say standardization is you get into multi-market, multi-location, yeah. you acquire multi-brands, like how you're administering uh, payroll and bonus programs and, and your policy manuals and PTO and uh, all those different things like standardization and simplicity should be a, a guiding force in all of your decisions. Uh, and I would say that's particularly true as you're integrating acquisitions. We, we experienced this with the roofing business, mm-hmm. uh, and we're, we're really dialed into this as we think about future partnerships. Is uh, if there's an opportunity to sort of align process, align workflow, align around a single technology platform, uh, we need to be be, be doing all of those things. Uh, because what I don't want to be is is 15 brands with different technologies and yeah. different methods of paying folks and on aligned benefit enrollment dates and renewal dates and uh, none of the, we just really standardization simplicity uh those are guiding principles that every leader needs to be driving towards if people want to get to know more about you where can they do that uh twitter linkedin give me a follow shoot me a dm uh, admittedly i'm super bad at keeping up with those inboxes but i may i may look at it i may not i don't know <laughs> Cool. Chris, thanks for coming on today. Uh, This was a lot of fun. I appreciate you opening up and this will be a great episode when it airs. It's going to help a lot of people. Thank you, Chris. Love it. Thanks for having me, guys. Great to see you. 